Digital Domain Park in Port St. Lucie, Florida. The New York Mets play at the Houston Astros. New York Mets spring training on SNY is presented by City. Late afternoon on the Florida beach. Perfect time for a clam bake, right? Well, you're running out of time because opening day is just a week away as the Mets sail toward the opener next Thursday. And a pleasant good evening, everybody, and welcome to Port St. Lucie. Gary Cohn, Ron Darling with you tonight as the Mets take on the Houston Astros. The Mets made some cuts today. They're down to just 28 players in camp. And as a consequence of, the, of today's cuts, a couple of very popular players are now destined to make the team. There are the guys who went out today, and no real surprises there. The backup catchers, Lucas May and Rob Johnson, out. Den Decker and uh, Val Despine, who were not expected to make the team, sent down. Adam Lowen beaten out for a job as the left-handed bat off the bench, and Garrett Olson goes down as well. But what this means is that Mike Nickius is guaranteed a spot on the opening day roster. And Mike Baxter will probably be there as well. Well, you know what's great about Mike Nicky? It's his second consecutive season. That it looks like he's going north with the Mets. Last year, of course, because Ronnie Polino had to serve that suspension. But that's great to have him. But Mike Baxter, I always say it takes a village to help you make the major leagues. Well, the village of Baxter is very happy as Mike Baxter, of course, has a real good chance to leave this camp and play with his hometown team. Of course, he grew up in the Mets village <laughs> just up the road in Whitestone from the ballpark. On the mound today is Mike Pelfrey. And Mike made some strides in his last start, but it has not been a good spring for Pelfrey in a spring in which all the other Mets starting pitchers have performed well. You know what's great is if you're having a good spring, it allows you to work on some pitches. But Mike has not had a good spring, and when you have a bad spring like he has, he needs one of those innings, five or six innings, where he doesn't give up a lot of runs so he can get his confidence back. So Pelfrey will be on the mound for the Mets against the ageless Levon Hernandez for the Astros. A week from opening day, it's the Mets and Astros. All the action on S. And why? New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by City, by Burger King, by Toyota. Hurry in, it's Toyota's number one for everyone sales event, Toyota. By W.B. Mason for amazingly low prices on office supplies. Who bought W.B. Mason? By Cholula Hot Sauce, the flavorful hot sauce with the iconic wooden cap. And by Bob's Discount Furniture. 
Bring the family into City Field with a Mets Power Pack for just $22. Your ticket includes a hot dog or burger, fries, and a soft drink. Visit Mets.com now for your Power Pack tickets. Here's your Mets upcoming schedule presented by City. You can also listen to every Mets game on Sports Radio 66 WFAN. Mets are on the road in Jupiter the next two days to play the Cardinals and the Marlins. We're back on the air on Picks 11 Sunday when the Mets play the Tigers. Our last spring broadcast Tuesday when the Mets entertain the Yankees. And then opening day Thursday the 5th. Start of a three-game series against the Atlanta Braves. Tonight it's the Mets and the Astros with Mike Pelfrey taking the hill. First pitch coming right up. Just another glorious day in Fort St. Lucie as we play the final night game of spring training. There's the Astros starting lineup brought to you by Ford. And if it seems like something of a no-name lineup, well, it's going to be a no-name season for the Astros. Carlos Lee, the regular first baseman. But other than that, there are not a lot of household names playing for Houston this year. I will say, though, I'm interested in seeing this young catcher, Jason Castro, and seeing he's supposed to be one of their up-and-coming stars. Here's the numbers so far this spring from Mike Pelfrey. Of course, they are not good. A hits the innings pitched uh, a not very good. And I was saying in the opening is that when you have a tough spring, I don't care who you are, the best of the best, the lowest of the lowest. When you're having a tough spring, you're trying to do anything to get some confidence, best way for Mike to do that is put up some zeros tonight. And defensively, the Lexus Mets defense behind Pell today. Bay, Hairston in center field. This is his second game. Uh, Baxter and is in there. Dude is not. Right to hot of Murphy Davis and Josh Tolley doing the catching of Pell. It's interesting. Nicky has caught Pelfrey in his last start. There's Mike Baxter playing right field. Andres Torres is progressing. Took batting practice today. Ran the bases. Uh, probably get some at bats on the minor league side tomorrow. But. If he's not ready to go on opening day, then uh, other than you know, Duda sitting out today, this this is probably the Mets' opening day starting eight. 
Well, since you mentioned Torres, was it you that told me that Angel Pagan is having a tough spring training there in Arizona? He was 0 for 23 at one point. That's more than tough. The, uh, the Giants felt as though they were getting an upgrade in terms of a leadoff hitter with Pagan replacing Torres, but um, so far it, it has not worked out that way. And it's going to be interesting to see who gets the better of that deal. Of course, the Mets also got Ramon Ramirez That's in right. that deal, which may tip it their way. J.B. Shuck will lead things off for the Astros. Jordan Schaefer, the former Brave, is supposed to be the regular center fielder for the Astros this year, but Schaefer hurt his hand. He's got some nerve problem with the hand. Saw a specialist in Atlanta Tuesday, and after uh, taking a, a lot of BP trying to get the hand better, now they've told him to rest it for a while. Well, he dove into a base and uh, into Omar Infante's knee, who was blocking the base. And J.B. Shuck, and he takes it low for ball one. Shuck hit 272 last year for the Astros and 81 at bat. Spent most of last year in Oklahoma City, where he had a very good year. Nearly a 400 on base percentage, and that's what they're looking for from Shuck is to eventually be a leadoff hitter for them. But this is an Astros team very much in transition. There's Jose Altuve on deck. 106 losses last year. They have new new ownership, new GM. Taking for a call strike here. There are people getting fired out of the front office every day as they uh, they clear house. In fact, they might be going to be transitioned themselves out of the National League, right? Mm -hmm. And Shuck pops it up. Ruben Tejada tracks it on the outfield grass, and that's the first down of the game. So one out of nobody on. Yeah, part of the, uh, the deal when Jim Crane bought the team was that he had to agree to move the Astros to the American League next year after what will be their 51st season in the National League. Here's Jose Altuve, the second baseman, just 21 years old. Having a good spring. Ronnie, in his last start, Pelfrey began bringing his hands back over his head. He, he moved a little further to the first base side of the rubber. Well, I, I think he's just trying to do a, a couple of things to change it up a little. Um, you guys did the game, Keith, and you did the game. And I sat right behind the plate and wanted to see for myself without looking at the monitor or... Uh, having to work up here what was really going on and there was a lot of good stuff that happened for Pelf Especially that sinker down in the right handers the problem I see though And we've seen it happen is that he'll be sailing along a couple of guys that get on and I, I don't know if you Folks were watching that Saturday. They started to put bunt plays on and I had to come in the Pelf to tell him what the bunt play was and then uh, the third baseman Turner was starting to put more on and they changed it back and forth then they had a pickoff play at second that he didn't execute and all of that really just seemed to throw him completely out of whack and that shouldn't happen for a veteran pitcher at this stage three and one to Altuve and he takes the fastball for a strike one thing that did happen on Saturday is that Belfry got up to a very good start in terms of throwing his sinker throwing it at a nice velocity and getting quick outs mm. which is something that is always important for Mike he should live from the knees down that's what 95% uh, of his pitches should be if he wants to throw that four seam, don't cut it just throw it about chest level to change the elevation for the hitter but majority of his pitches should be for the knees down On three and two he gets the ground ball and Murphy makes the play for the second out So two up and two set aside. And now Justin Ruggiano, the right fielder. Ruggiano played with Tampa Bay last year in 248. Just got back from Texas where he was with his wife, the proud parents of a baby girl born on Tuesday. And he lines one over the head of David Wright in the base hit for Ruggiano. Tracked to the line by Bay. Ruggiano heading for second. And he's in standing with a two out double. Well, this pitch, the reason it was hit here just over the head of David Wright was that that was sinker from Pelfi, but it was just up. It was about waist level. A nice job by Ruggiano hitting that ball down the line. See that ball that was about waist level. 
and he knew right away, especially with two outs, that you could have tried to push the envelope, and he did for a double. So Ruggiano, the first base runner of the game. And now J.D. Martinez, the cleanup hitter and left fielder. And he takes the sinker for a strike. Martinez got over 200 at bats with Houston last year as they started to make the transition, dealt a lot of their veteran players away. Martinez, 24 years old, drafted in 09 by Houston. That's 12 RBIs this spring to lead the club. The Astros have actually swung the bat very well this spring. They're averaging almost five runs per game. They're an interesting team. They've taken their one of their better starters the last couple of seasons. Their best two seasons ago. He's now the closer again. Brett Myers. Or again for Houston. He was the closer for Philadelphia that one season. Martinez goes around one and two. Well, Brad Mills announced Wandy Rodriguez will be his opening day starter, but I think it's fair to say that Wandy will be available to any bidder who comes along with a reasonable offer, and probably the same is true of Myers. He'll be their Oswalt this year. <laughs> Maybe not quite the same uh, pitcher, yeah. Same level. But really, there are only three recognizable players on this Houston team. You got Wandy Rodriguez, Brett Myers, and Carlos Lee. And once you get past those three guys, it's all youngsters or retreads. It's Brad Mills, the manager for the Houston Astros. But you have to give the Astros credit because they've taken the right approach in that they were going nowhere with the old teams that they had. And they have decided to build the team back up through the farm system. They know they're going to take a hit for a couple of years. Pelfrey strikes out Martinez. And that's the third out. First strike out for Pelfrey. That's come to bat when we come back. Check out the Geico Mets starting lineup for it tonight. Ruben Tejada, who will hit lead off opening day if Andres Torres isn't ready to go, is in that spot tonight. Mike Baxter having a good spring, subbing for Lucas Duda, who has had an exceptional spring, probably better than any Met offensive player. And is Levon Hernandez, 174 wins, thrown over 3,000 innings, 50 complete games. 200 innings or more, 10 times, goes on and on. Yvonne is now officially 37 years old. Officially, and that's right. I, I just said that in passing. I didn't <laughs> want to draw a particular attention to it. Yvonne has started more games than any active pitcher. Little flare out into right center. And cutting across with a dive is Ruggiano to make a fine play to retire Tejada. 
what a play by Reggiano. Got a great jump on this baseball and through the sun makes a, do I dare say it, Sabota like catch in right field. Sorry, that's up. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't grow up a Mets fan, so I can say it. You can't say it. <laughs> that would be like a guy, the equivalent of a guy going on a nice September hot streak and calling him Ustrasky. Okay, okay, I get it. Okay, fighting words. Got it. Dave <laughs> takes ball one. <laughs> anyway, it was a nice play by uh, by Ruggiano. It was. So, so Levon has started more games in the majors than any active pitcher, more even than the guy who pitched in Tokyo today. Bartolo Colon. What a day he had, Gary. I mean, he's held together with spit and glue and some kind of uh, oxygenated blood. <laughs> and uh, he pitched an absolute gem today. Eight, was it eight innings, 86 pitches? 86 pitches. I mean, just amazing. Just with two seamers and change-ups. That's all he threw. By the way, if, if you haven't been paying attention, the, the season has begun. That's right. That's right. The, uh, the A's and the Mariners went to Japan, as the Mets did 12 years ago when they opened the season against the Cubs at the Tokyo Dome. And they have now split their series, and they're heading home. Now, when the Mets played in Japan, did they come home and play the season? Because these teams are going to have a week to kind of break it down and get back into... I think they came back to Florida, if I recall correctly, and played a couple of exhibitions. Okay. I might have that wrong. But it was the same kind of schedule as Murphy hits it on the right side and passed the dive about two goals. And Murphy has a base hit. Well, very interesting. Altuve was playing Daniel Murphy to pull, and it cost him a ball up the middle. But usually it's a play for the second baseman. It loses Altuve. So now David Wright. David got the day off yesterday after playing his first two games of the spring on Monday and Tuesday. Played four innings the first day, six innings the second day, and uh, showing absolutely no ill effects from that small abdominal tear. Got the day off yesterday to kind of rest his sore body, which is just natural soreness from having you know, not played in a few weeks. Well, he, David was talking about it, and you mentioned it in the last time I worked with you, Gary, that David says the getting in ready position defensively over and over is the one that really kind of, uh, you don't practice that, of course. And Castro knocks down the breaking ball, and it's one and one. Nice job by the young catcher. Castro missed all of last year with a torn ACL. And then hurt his foot playing in the Arizona Fall League. Got to undergo surgery, so it's been a long road back for him. <laughs> Left it to right. Ruggiano looking through the sunglasses. And they're two out. Here's the course light Astros defense. Martinez, Shuck, and Ruggiano who's caught both outs. Downs, Gonzalez, Altuve, and Wallace is going to be at first base this evening. And Castro behind the plate. So two out, Murphy at first, and here's Ike Davis. Ike hitting just 190 in spring training. But most importantly, has looked healthy. No ill effects from the ankle injury that cost him nearly five months of the season last year. No ill effects from the valley fever that caused headlines back in February. It's interesting to watch Ike so far in spring training. To me, and this is by the naked eye, uh, it seems like he's holding his hands lower mm -hmm. before the pitch comes, trying to eliminate one of those dropping of the hands. It's this one to deep left center. Martinez back and has enough room to reel it in. Very tired of the side. Been not blowing quite as hard to left as it has been most days. No score after one.
We go to the second inning in Port St. Lucie. Digital Domain Park. Brad Wallace will lead off for the Astros. Wallace who got the shot to be the first baseman for the Astros last year and had mixed results. Now just trying to stay on the ball club as a backup to Carlos Lee who has moved in from the outfield. Wallace at 259 last year only five home runs and 336 of bats which playing in that band box in Houston yeah. is not a great recommendation. Slashes one the other way a foul ball and he broke his bat. Let's send it downstairs where Kevin Burkhardt is hanging out. Kev? Tim Burdak uh, you know, wasn't originally thought you would make the opening day roster after this meniscus surgery, but you're, you're healing quite rapidly. How are you feeling? Oh, feeling good. Uh, a few bullpens back to back days. Thank you, Justin. Um, you're the human shield, so thanks. <laughs> understandable down here. All the grief that I give these guys in the bullpen. We're getting a little bit back today, which is good. Uh, you know, it actually felt great. Um, back to back days, uh, throwing bullpens and stuff. We'll take tomorrow off and uh, maybe try to sneak into a minor league game on uh, Saturday. And it was only just over two weeks ago did you think it was realistic to be back at this point where you are back to back bullpens already yeah uh, well you know I mean it's one of those situations where that was the kind of time frame they gave me two to three weeks uh, get back to where we're supposed to be and you know everything's falling into place right now how about you you know I, I remember I think we interviewed you the first game and you talked about you know kind of working your arm slot a little bit and get to that point when you missed the two weeks and did you know how do you get back to where you were before the surgery well, you know, that's the, the nice thing about having Dan, who was with, you know, with me, obviously, all of your last year and stuff, and knowing me. Um, if he sees a little bit of something right there, like I said, the past couple days in the pen, if I creeped up a little bit too high, he reminded me right away of it. And so just trying to lock in that a little bit. You know, it's just going to be a little bit more difficult, but it's something that can't, you know, can't be done. You watch uh, uh, this team play as we get ready for open day. You watch Pell Free Pitch, and I know there's a guy's lockers right across from you here. I mean, what do you see from him? What do you see from his demeanor? You know, the guys were talking about him and how he's trying to, you know, just get some positive results. So what are you seeing from him away from the field that maybe we don't get a chance to see? Well, you know, I think that's the whole thing. You know, he, this guy, he has confidence, you know, uh, whether, you know, people see it out there or not. We know the type of pitcher that he is and who he can be for us. You know, uh, he'll be fine as a spring training. You know, uh, when, you don't evaluate a, a player in spring training. You don't evaluate him in September. You know, that's just the way it is. We know what he's going to give us. You know, uh, that's just who Mike Pelfrey is, and I think he'll be just fine. Wallace has a double against Pelfrey here. You know, is there, as you get ready for opening day, is there um, an urgency in the clubhouse to, you know, just to get some wins? Does that type of thing matter to, you know, to play good ball coming into the final week here before for the thing really counts? You know, the wins are going to come. You know, if they do, they do. And if they don't, you know, it, we know that when the bell rings that first opening day of the season, that, that's when it all matters. You know, down here, you know, you want to go out, you want to stay healthy. You know, you want, you know, for hitters, they want to put good strings on the bat. You know, out on the ball, you know, for us pitchers, we want to make sure we're locating the ball and stuff and moving it around. And that's really the bottom line is just kind of dialing in the final little, little, little tune of just here and there to get ready. Um, how has this effect, uh, affected the Hulkster? I mean, early in camp, we saw you uh, transform into Hulk Hogan. It, uh, has the knee surgery slowed him down? Well, no, no. You know what? Uh, now that I'm starting to get back, I'm getting a little bit more mouthier during stretch and everything. But, you know, they're starting to, you know, realize that, you know, I'm slowly coming back and they're, you know, being more amused during stretch. <laughs> Between Justin Turner over here and Santana over here, I've got about a pound of seeds down my shirt, guys. So I'm going to send it back to you. Shake them all out. You, you deserve some combat play. And, and I, I think it's nice that our cameraman pulled back so we could really get a look at, at Justin Turner uh, <laughs> providing the, uh, the the incoming mortar shells. Well, Kevin, that's uh, some kind of job. <laughs> has to take that. <laughs> man, oh, man. You know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that is very unusual, you don't hear about it very often, when a pitcher has leg injuries, He's still able to throw, you know, and I'm not throw, so I'm a throwing on the mound, but he's still able to play some catch, and that really matters in you coming back quickly. That's going to play the infield halfway here with Wallace at third and one out, and catcher Jason Castro the batter. Castro having a very good spring coming back from the knee and foot injuries, and he takes the curveball from Pelfrey for a strike. Now, um, Burdak is hoping that he'll be ready opening day. And uh, the Mets still have Danny Herrera and Josh Edgen in camp. And we talked the other day about the possibility that if only for the first series of the year against Atlanta that the Mets might consider carrying two lefties. And I asked Terry Collins that question this afternoon and he said absolutely we've had those discussions. It's going to depend on some other things and how they break. They really want to keep Miguel Batista as the long man. And, and so that is affected by, by that decision as well. But all things being equal, you'd have to think that if even if Burdak is ready, that they'd want to keep probably Herrera yeah. around as that second lefty. 
Hits sharply up the middle, and the Astros get their first run. Wallace trots in to score on the base hit by Castro, and it's one nothing Houston. Well, back to back there for Mike Pelfrey, back with a breaking ball. Started off Castro with a get me over breaking ball, came back again, and he was waiting for it. Here's Marwin Gonzalez, who's a uh, chance to make the ball club uh, was greatly enhanced yesterday when Jed Lowry hurt his hand trying to dive back into second base in a game against the Marlins. And he bounces it down to first. Davis with the high throw and Tejada comes down on the bag and they get the force. Mike took his time, normally very sure with his throws to second base, but that one pulled Tejada off the bat. Well, you see, the first part, it was a little difficult for Davis because it came through the sun. But nice job by Tejada, just making sure to get that out with a little errant throw here by Ike. I doubt they would have had been able to make the 3-6-3 anyway. So Gonzalez now the runner at first with two out and Levon Hernandez who has been one of the best hitting pitchers in baseball for 15 years. So we'll get a crack at Pelfrey. You know Gary you're talking about the left handers if they didn't have the conversation. But they certainly did after watching Freddie Freeman the other day and his two home run effort. You know you got Freeman you have McCann. You have Hayward. Those guys have to be pitched to by left handers in crucial situations. Chopper for Murphy. And Levon never runs particularly hard out of the box. That makes Murphy's stats that much easier. But the Astros put up a run on the Castro RBI single. Kevin gets the brush off now. Jason Bain leads off the home second for New York against Levon Hernandez. Jason's had a rough spring, just seven for 33, and only a couple of extra base hits and no RBIs. And uh, Sandy Alderson was making the point yesterday that it's just that Jason's not driving the ball at all. And at some point, you have to see Jason not only making contact, but driving the ball to the gaps. Well, I watched uh, Jason taking batting practice today, and he and Dave Hudgens were having a spirited discussion, and it was all about those kind of things, that he didn't feel like he was, that he had a nice foundation, a good base to drive the ball, that he felt like he was out on his front foot, and I think that's been the result of why there's been so many ground balls. So a curve from Levon is one and two. And Keith, of course, can explain this much better than I, but if you get off on your front foot, you have nothing left, no power left. You only, you only have your hands left to try to hit the baseball. Now Levon. 
Brown with the one two and he just misses the outside corner. We were having a conversation in our uh, broadcast on Tuesday about the possibility of Duda continues to hit and Bay continues to struggle of uh, Terry shaking up his batting order a little bit. And uh, in fact Terry made the point yesterday that for the first series he's going to keep Bay fifth and Duda sixth. In deference to the fact that he, he wants to make it more difficult for Freddy Gonzalez to use the two lefties in his bullpen. But beyond that, you have to think that if things keep going the way they are, that Duda's got to move up and bay down. There's ball four and bays out with a leadoff walk. You know, Gary, I think a lot of times uh, you can change the lineup, but you really have to understand the bullpen of the other team. Now, Atlanta, of course, you've got to uh, account for those great left handers in the bullpen. Uh, Bastardo for Philadelphia is a guy that maybe you don't want him to have to uh, face both Davis and Duda. So maybe sometimes they have a great left hander in the bullpen. You might shy away from that. Right. And uh, Washington is the second opponent. They've got a more pedestrian yeah. left handed core. They've got Sean Burnett, they might have Tom Borzolani. It's not quite the same uh, level of concern. Here's Mike Baxter getting the start in right field, takes high and away for ball one. Baxter is almost there. He's not quite on the opening day roster, if only because the waiver wires are likely to open up in the next couple of days. We've talked about this a couple of times during spring training, a change in the collective bargaining rules for players with major league experience who are brought in on minor league contracts. Tomorrow, for most teams, is the day of decision. Out to center field and Shuck is out there. One away. And teams that want to send those players to the minor leagues need to hand them a hundred thousand dollar bonus to keep them around. And uh, tomorrow's the day that they've got to make that payment. So there might be a few guys uh, heading toward the waiver wire tomorrow. What a baseball world we live in, right? Demoted, he even got some cash. That's pretty good. Well, the Mets have one player in that circumstance yeah, right. in Miguel Batista. And as of now, Batista's scheduled to pitch Saturday. So it's a pretty good bet that he's going to be sticking around and making the Major League roster. Here's Scott Hairston, who made his spring debut yesterday, played center field, and went 0 for 3. And uh, no ill effects from the oblique injury that ended his season last year and has short circuited his spring. And Hairston becomes of vital importance now because while the Mets hope to have Andres Torres back by opening day, it's certainly not guaranteed. You know, what's interesting is that you've always counted on Scott Hairston's bat. I'm more interested in watching him play center field and see if he can do it on an everyday basis. Scott hit just 235 last year, but he had seven home runs, three of those as a pinch hit. The shadow is really playing a part here at this. 6 10 start. In the air to left over toward the corner. And Martinez gets back there to grab it. It's running grab by JD Martinez for the second out. Well, Scott Harrison just a little quick on this fastball right down the middle. Got that just off the end of the bat. That's a pitch that you don't usually see him miss during the course of the year. See that? That ball's middle, middle. We've seen how good he is with that fastball up. And just missed it. Levon can uh, force you to be a little slow. Yes. He adds and subtracts as, as well as any veteran pitcher in baseball. There's Josh Tolley. Josh having a nice spring with the bat as he takes the curveball for a strike, but more importantly, a more consistent time of it defensively. He's just uh, his uh, blocking of the ball in the dirt has gotten exponentially better. His throwing has gotten better. Footwork, all those things. And I think it's going to lead to him having a better offensive season. Toward left center field, a long run back to Shuck near the track, and he won't look for it. It short hops the wall. Here comes Bay around third and heading home. Josh Coley with an RBI double. And the Mets get even at one. Well, you're used to seeing Tolley hit the ball to left center. You're not used to seeing him drive the ball that way. And you'll like to see that. Last year we talked about him trying to pull the ball a little bit. He doesn't need to. He's got power to the uh, left center field. And this was fortunate for the Mets because that one hopper, of course, allowed Bay to score. Head right on the baseball. Anything middle of the plate away is a strength for Josh. Tolley's fifth RBI of the spring, and so the game is even at one. Now Mike Pelfrey 
Lifetime 097 hitter. And he takes off the plate for ball one. So we chronicled in the open the uh, the cuts the Mets made today and the you know, some of the decisions that, that still need to be made. Of course, all that can get upset because of that, that waiver wire and guys who might be available at the last moment. But I, I, I think the thought on, on Terry Collins' part is that by the end of this weekend, he'd like to have his team set. That's will finish up here in Port St. Lucie on Tuesday as you look at the guys who were sent back to minor league camp today, including Jordani Valdespin, who you know will be back at some point. Yes. I mean, great camp. He might be as athletic as anybody the Mets have now. Well, I think he is the most athletic uh, in, in the Mets camp this season. I mean, for years that designation went to Angel Pagan, and uh, with Reyes close behind, of right. course. And uh, but Valdespin, he really draws your attention. His his movements on the field, his ability to do as many different things as he has this spring, offensively and defensively, is eye popping. Now the question is. Can he be an everyday player at some point in the big league? You know, it's interesting. I know you watched the game from the berm the other day. If you did not know he was not a center fielder, you wouldn't be able to tell by the way he went in the gaps and caught a couple of uh, fly balls. Especially going back on the ball, which yeah. is just not a natural thing for a, a guy who's been playing the infield all his life, and he made it look natural. Levon strikes out Pelfrey, his first strikeout. Mets get even, though, after a Jason Bay walk. Josh Tolley with a two out hit as he drives one to left center. And the Mets get even 1 1 with the Astros after two. Mike Pelfrey back to the mound for the third inning. Mets and Astros tied at one. Top of the batting order for Houston, J.B. Shuck will lead off. The other day the Astros came here, they had J.B. Shuck playing center and Travis Buck in right. Shuck and Buck <laughs> outfield. Shuck out of Ohio State. 24 years old, drafted by the Astros in 08. Popped a short his first time up. And he bounces this one for Daniel Murphy to handle. One out. New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by Xerox, ready for real business. I don't hear of a lot of baseball players from Ohio State. I mean, naturally, of course, uh, they have those great football teams. But in the Notre Dame, you hear some baseball players from. Not a lot of Buckeyes in baseball, it seems to me. Trying to think offhand yeah. with anybody. There's Jose Altuve, and he gets a two hopper to Tejada. And Ike does nicely to stay on the bag for the second out. Well, a big hop here for Tejada. The high throw. 
And the greatest insurance policy the Mets have at first base is like Davis. It's amazing the difference that it makes for all the other infielders having a top quality defense. He's got great, great footwork. Um, he's a tall guy anyway, but he even plays taller when he's catching the baseball over there. Jason Ruggiano takes a strike. Ruggiano doubled his first time up. All right, I've got I've got the list right here. Oh, you do. Oh. And so he can do anything. How about this? But I completely forgot he was an Ohio State guy. He played basketball there. Frank Howard. Oh. Well, I mean, I knew Ohio State because, you know, growing up a Celtics fan, you know, have a check, right? And you guys had a pretty good Ohio State guy with the Knicks. Jerry Lucas was from Ohio State, right? Mm -hmm. I'm looking up and down the list. There's not a lot else. <laughs> Remember Steve Arlen with the podcast? Yes, yeah. Maybe. Well, maybe if, if you have Frank Howard, you don't need anyone else. Galen, Galen Sisko. Oh, okay. Okay. Joe Sparma. <laughs> but I mean, that's, yeah, that, yeah. that's, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best I can here. <laughs> it's actually a pitcher in the big leagues right now from Ohio State, Corey Lubke. Okay. With uh, San Diego. San Diego. Yeah, I'm about done. Okay. <laughs> the, the next level is Barry Bunnell. Okay. <laughs> it's the true Tito Ruggiano in a late swing foul. Was, oh, catcher's interference on Josh Tolley. You know, this rule, and I know that it's to stop the catchers from interfering with the hitters, but this was not Josh Tolley's fault. Ruggiano did not pick up the baseball and swung incredibly late, and he sw swung the bat right down on Tolley's glove. It's hard to fault the catcher there when the hit is so full that he swings so late. Yeah, if you're late enough, you can almost induce that call. So it's no turn it back for Ruggiano, an error charge to Tolly. And the Astros have a two out base runner. J.D. Martinez, the batter. Ruggiano takes off the throw by Tolly, and Josh erases his mistake by gunning him down on the very next pitch. Nicely done by Josh, who's been throwing the ball very well all spring. Murphy gets the tag down, and Ruggiano, who reached. On Tolly's error, gone on Tolly's throw. Levon Hernandez back to the mound for the bottom of the third. That's will send up the top of the batting order. Ruben Tejada leads off in a 1-1 game. Tejada robbed of a hit and a nice diving catch by Justin Ruggiano in right field his first time up. First pitch curveball from Levon for a strike. Ruben in the leadoff spot tonight. He is basically plan B yeah. to lead off. And that's not just if Andres Torres is not 
ready physically to start on opening day, but you look at the numbers from last year and Torres's drop off from 2010. If he were to get off to a slow start in terms of getting on base out of the leadoff spot, then Tejada might get the call as well. Now, Ruben has started only six games in his career as a leadoff hitter. He had that and Reyes in front of him. That's right. Well, you know, I just think the collaterally, so many things happen if Torres can't go. You know, you don't have your leadoff guy. You don't have a guy who can go get it in center field or has the experience of going and getting it. Um, you know, so a lot, and it takes Tejada out of his position. There's so, there's so many things if Torres can't make the bell. We yeah. saw it early in spring training how much he was stealing and running and there's the one two. There has been one development on that front, which is that Kurt Neuenheis, who was sent to the minor leagues a couple of weeks ago and couldn't play because of an oblique injury, has begun to swing the bat again. And there has been some rumbling that if Torres can't make opening day, then maybe the Mets might consider bringing in Neuenheis. That's picked out of the air on a soft liner. Wallace grabs it for the first down. I mean, he's certainly of all the candidates that the Mets would have to replace Torres in center field has the best combination of offense and defense. But of course, he's also never played in the big league. Never played in the big leagues. He uh, he look, reminds me now. Of course, you know we haven't seen him play in the major league level. He reminds me of kind of a, a smaller version of Jim Edmonds in the way he gets jumps on the baseball. Maybe not as flashy. Who could be as flashy? That's right. <laughs> Shot by Murphy backing off his downs to play the hop and quickly there are two down. I mean don't get me wrong Jim Edmonds was a great center fielder but he would set himself up to be a little more spectacular than he had to. I played with Lenny. Lenny Dykstra could do that also is that uh, you know that little slow down right before the dive for the baseball to uh, and that was before top ten for Lenny. <laughs> Lenny was ahead of his time. <laughs> <right. laughs> I shouldn't use the word time. I got exactly. Two out and nobody on. Here's David Wright who fly to right his first time up. Yeah, there's been such a focus on David getting healthy through this uh, abdominal tear he suffered this spring. There really hasn't been a lot of talk about David needing to have a big bounce back year. I mean, he missed two months last year because of the back injury. And when he did play, his numbers were the lowest that they've been in his career as he drives this one out to right. And Ruggiano is there. But David is, uh, is hoping to put the memory of 2011 behind him. Quick inning for Levon Hernandez, 1 1 after three.
J.D. Martinez leads off the fourth inning for the Astros. Pelfrey struck out Martinez his first time up. The team got a run in the second inning. Pelfrey has been getting more than his share of ground balls, and that's a very good sign for Mike tonight. And he gets another one. This one off the foot of Martinez, and it's 0-2. You, were, you and I were having a conversation between innings, Ronnie, talking about the, the shortened dimensions of yeah. City Field and you know, how it might impact a guy like David Wright. And it brought to mind a note that I think we've mentioned, oh, I don't know, about 50,000 times <laughs> over the course of these broadcasts over the years that no Met has ever hit three home runs in a Mets home game. Nobody did it at the Polo Grounds, no Met did it at Shea, and no Met has hit three home runs in a game at City Field. So it, it got me to thinking there are actually four players who hit three home runs against the Mets in a game in New York once at the Polo Grounds and three times at Shea it has not happened at City Field. So the question is who are the four. Now we don't have an official trivia question in spring training which means that we did have one in the last broadcast. Did you? Yes we did. We, we threw everything we had at the wall in the last broadcast. I said I think three words the entire game. Lifted out to the right and Baxter in and tore the line. <laughs> Martinez retired one away. Anyway, so give me the four. Well, the four players were all prominent players. One of them was actually at one time, at, at actually a couple of different times, was a Met who hit three home runs against the Mets. And he's actually the last guy to do it. In 1979, Dave Kingman, as a Cub, hit three home runs at Shea. The first guy to hit three home runs against the Mets at the Polo Grounds was Stan Musial wow. in 1962. The other two, one wouldn't surprise you because he was one of the greatest sluggers of his time. That was Richie Allen. Okay. Hit three in 1968 with the Phillies. The other one would surprise you if only because he was a fantastic player, although not a Hall of Famer, but he wasn't known as a home run hitter. Hmm. And I don't know if he did, but he could have hit him from both sides of the plate. Wow. What year? 1978. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Rose. Exactly who it was. Pete Rose with three home runs. April 29th, wow. 1978. At Shea. Well, that was honestly my first brush with kind of fame as when I became a professional player. My first spring training in Pompano Beach, Florida with the Texas Rangers. And I got to meet Richie Allen and talk with him for about an hour. And that was one of the great joys of my life that day. Because, uh, you know, he's a very opinionated athlete and had a lot of interesting things to say. And it was, it was great. I ran into Richie when he was a minor league batting coach in the White Sox organization. I want to say uh, 1986. And I thought at the time, you know, as a young whippersnapper broadcaster, that it was fascinating that a guy who was known for not taking batting practice <laughs> grew up to be a batting coach. Pulled down to third. <laughs> but Richie, he had all sorts of incredible ideas about hitting. Yeah. I caught it very well from all indications. Nice inning for Pelfrey. Two more ground balls in a 1 2 3 inning.
Mike Davis leads off the home fourth inning against Levon Hernandez. Mike lifted one to pretty deep left field his first time up. It'll be Davis Bay and Baxter for the Mets in the bottom of the fourth. That's with just two hits off Levon Hernandez. So what else is new? <laughs> Levon came up the latter part of the 1997 season with the Marlins and had an enormous impact from the day he arrived. Helped the Marlins to the postseason that year and was the MVP of both the League Championship Series and the World Series. As Davis jumps one to the left field for a leadoff hit. Well, we were talking during the opening of the broadcast about those fortunate fellows who have survived the cuts and made the team, and one of them standing by with Kevin Burkhart. Yeah, Mike Nickus is here, guys. And, and Mike, you know, you, you did make the team last year and then were there until uh, Polino came off uh, the suspension. You make the team today, you know, and, and what does that mean to you? What does it feel like? Has it sunk in just to, making the team and being a big part of this team? Now? Yeah, I don't know if it's quite sunk in yet, but it is uh, an incredible feeling, Kevin. And it's just, you know, I can't wait for the year to get started now. Can, Mike, can you explain all these years in the organization? Uh, you came over in the Victor Diaz trade years ago. You're, you, you know, you've been here for so long. You've put in all your time in the minor leagues to now at this point stay with it and have this opportunity. Describe that. It just feels, it's an incredible feeling to feel like I'm actually a part of it. And I'm a part of, you know, what we're going to be doing day to day. Uh, be it, you know, understanding other teams, what they're trying to do. Trying to help this pitching staff win as many baseball games as possible. Just to feel like that's, uh, that I'm a big big piece of the puzzle. I, uh, it's, it's a great feeling. You know, did, was there a difference coming into spring training? Obviously, you're familiar with the organization, the surroundings. But coming in, you know, Terry had said in the offseason that, hey, you know, right now, Mike is kind of the leader. Uh, for that for that catching tandem with Josh Tully did that make a difference in how you approach things and how you felt about things it didn't it didn't I, I still was gonna go and I knew I had a lot of work to do uh, I knew that you know in, until they tell you that you know you're the guy you're not uh, so it was still coming in trying to prove that uh, I put in the work that was gonna get me an opportunity to play out there and so uh, from that sense it was uh, it's great to kind of feel that uh, some of the work I did has, has paid off and they've seen something what what kind of work has paid off exactly really I think a lot of it was the offensive stuff and uh, I, I think they've seen throughout the spring uh, in my bats here BPs at bats on the other side that uh, I've made some quality adjustments and I'm gonna continue to keep working and hopefully it uh, continues to keep going. When, you, when you say offensive stuff Tell me exactly. Give me one specific thing that you worked on, maybe with a coach or on tape, that, that you think has translated to the game. I've just been great for me. I think I'm driving the ball to the right side now, and I'm, I'm not losing my barrel like I was so much last year where I kind of hit just that weak line drive or that weak pop fly. I feel like I'm driving the ball a little bit better over there, and it's, uh, it's made me a more complete hitter. It's made me a tougher out. You know, Mike, when you now go into the season now and you get ready to go, uh, what are the things that you see from this team that um, are going to be important to success once things count? And Jason Bay, that'll be important. You get a little base hit, Mets have a couple on. But, you know, what, what does it feel from you and from this clubhouse of things that have to happen to have success? Well, I think we have to stay together as a team. I know there's been a lot of stuff that hasn't necessarily been positive about what we're trying to do here, but that's fine. That's We've accepted that. If our core group, if this group can stay together, play as a team, uh, we're going to shock a lot of people. You and Josh have uh, been friends. You know, obviously, at one point, you kind of crossed paths in the organization when he got the call earlier than you. So you've had that uh, relationship. How about him defensively? You know, it's been, uh, he has talked about it, you know, working with Bobby Nadel and working with Bob Guerin. But I know you two talk all the time. What have you talked about, and where have you seen his improvement behind the plate? Uh, he's becoming more mature as a player, as a catcher. Uh, you know, he's still very young, and I think he's doing a fantastic job. You saw a great example of that guy he just threw out. Um, he just looks more polished as a catcher now. I think uh, what Josh and I are both trying to do is understand uh, how we're going to attack opposing hitters, what our, our pitchers are trying to do, uh, and we're going to kind of spitball with each other uh, all the time. So we're on the same page. So when we go into it, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to beat some guys. Almost you go into it as a team is what you're telling like what you're saying. There's no question. Josh and I, you know, we have a great relationship. We've played together for parts of five years. Uh, so us working together is, is going to be a strength. You have always been one to, to talk to everybody, you know, whether it's your teammates, media, whatever, give input. Is it easier to give input to teammates and to pitchers on the staff now that you know you are a member of this team and going to be a member of this team? No question, no question. I think, you know, I don't want to say it's a respect level, but, uh, you know, when, you, when your face has been around and when guys have seen you play for quite a while, they understand what you bring to the table, they understand your strengths, and uh, you can kind of play off that, and, and, and they'll listen to you more. Mike, you caught um, 
Mike Pelfrey the last start. And Mike felt that there was some improvement. You know, even Mets officials talked about improvement. What did you see uh, about him the last start that maybe can kind of show you that the, there was some progress made? Well, I mean, really obviously the velocity was fantastic. The ball was coming out of his hand great. Uh, he's made some mechanical adjustments, and those take time to kind of set. Uh, but the velocity was fantastic. Uh, working on the off-speed stuff, still getting more comfortable with that. I think, you know, I just warmed him up in between innings. Uh, seen his slider movement, his curveball movement. Uh, looks much better than just last outing. Last outing. So, um, you know, he's got a lot of upside right now. Well, Mike, congratulations. Uh, guys, I know that uh, I know that this guy will certainly appreciate the introductions at opening day and getting that applause at City Field, no question. Mike, good luck to you. We'll see you soon. Guys, back up to you. Well, he'll appreciate it, and I think uh, everybody connected with the ball club will appreciate having Mike around for the full season. Yeah, Mike Dickey is, is a class act, and he just brings instant credibility uh, wherever he goes, especially in that clubhouse. Two and two to Mike Baxter with two aboard, and Baxter goes down swinging as Levon pulls the string on the curveball. I don't know if Levon is pitching or just trying to tantalize the hitter. Because that's what he does. The appearance that it's going to be a strike and he keeps breaking into the dirt. Scooped up by Castro. I also think that Kevin Burkhardt has a chance to go north with us. He's pretty good. <laughs> He's definitely a first team. <laughs> it's Scott Harrison who fly deep to left his first time up. I, I want to address with you. A phrase that I don't think I heard much until this spring, and now I've probably heard it about 50 times. Yeah. And most of it has been in relation to Mike Pelfrey, but it's been used in reference to some other guys, too. The ball feels good slash looks good coming out of his hand. Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't want, I, I shouldn't say that. I definitely understand what they're trying to say. Um, you know, in my day, a thousand years ago, you would just say, hey, you know, I... I Really had some good velocity. I felt like it was thrown hard. Uh, the ball was really moving, things like that. I, I think what they're trying to say is that instead of really overexerting and, and trying to push the ball up there, that it's really coming out of the hand free and easy. So when the ball comes out of your hand free and easy, it's going to have more life. And it also it means that your mechanics are right. You're getting to the point where you can just let it go as opposed to trying to force it up there. Harrison rips one through the hole. Davis will stop at third, and the Mets have the bases loaded. So three hits in the inning off Levon Hernandez. And the Mets have them loaded up for Josh Tolan. Does it also mean that maybe there's, I don't know, maybe a greater sense of confidence in that you're not squeezing the ball quite as much? Is that part of it? I, I think that's part of it. And also, I think that, you know, when. You know, a lot of, the, of, of today's players uh, go through the process of having someone help them uh, to deliver their message to the media a little better, right? And what happens is when you say that, things like that, it, it can kind of try to say, listen, I didn't have great results, but, you know, there is a positive thing happening here. So, I, you know, we, we did the same thing in our day. We had just different phrases for it. Here's Tolley who drove a double left center to drive in the first mid run and Castro goes down in the dirt to stop that breaking ball one and up. Hey Ronnie, how'd you feel today out there? Well, if we could have made a couple of plays, I think, uh, you know, we might have better results. Sure. There's one. Throwing those teammates under the bus. Exactly. <laughs> Take it. You took it that way. I didn't have it. <laughs> Umpire missed a couple of close ones. It could have really turned the tide there in the third. It's all kind of, keep going. <laughs> He just could have pushed across a couple of those uh, those runners that were out there. <laughs> That's right. Another tantalizing curve ball in for a strike to Tolly. Tolly didn't like it either. This little curve ball that he kind of just spins up in the strike zone. And you see where it ends up below the knees of Tolly, but you call it as it crosses the plate. C.B. Buckner, the home plate umpire, getting the withering look. <laughs> Two balls and a strike to Tolly. Levon Hernandez might be the only pitcher in the major leagues whose heart rate goes down when the paces are low. Everyone else gets a little anxious. He does not. The Bjorn Borg of <laughs> Yes, you're right. Good call. Brad Mills now in his third year as a skipper of the Astros. 
I mean, the Astros had a, uh, a pretty big trade this morning uh, when they got Jed Lowry, who we talked about. And of course, there's a young right-hander, Kyle Whelan, too, that uh, has a chance and is fighting Levon Hernandez for that spot. Whelan, sorry. It's all about getting younger for these Astros. With the, uh, They've got this guy in the rotation, so maybe they're not quite so young. 3-1 to Tolley, and he lines a base hit. Davis is in to score. Bay held up. He'll stop at third. Josh Tolley with his second RBI hit of the game, and the Mets go up 2-1. to one. Well, this can sometimes be the problem for veteran pitchers, the second and third time through the lineup. Not full this time is Josh. Good swing now, 2-2. Two for two. Sharp base hit to right field. It's interesting that Jason Bay on second base froze on that uh, ball, but you're taught any kind of line drive if you freeze, but that ball easily in the hole. That's Jason. The ball's hit by Tolley. You can see that it's definitely going to be in the hole, but Jason wanted to make sure. You know, that's what you're taught. The ball, line drive, you just stop. But he kind of went back. Now the bases remain loaded with one out. Now Mike Pelfrey will step in. With the Mets now in front, two to one. Pelfrey struck out his first time up. The Astros will keep the infield at double play depth. This is a quandary for a manager and a problem for the pitcher. When you're not a good hitting pitcher, and, and, you know. Mike's had plenty of time to establish whether he's a good or not good hitting pitcher. You want to don't want to make two outs here. I mean that is the key. Well, the old saying is if you think you're going to hit into a double play, by all means strike out. <laughs> and certainly the competitive side of you, of course, does not think that. You're thinking I'm getting a base knock. Your base is loaded. You never thought you were going to hit into a double play. I, I didn't, uh, but I should have gave it more thought. Because I'm sure it happened many times. <laughs> 0-2 oh, to Pelfrey with Ruben Tejada on deck. And that's just missed. One and two. I think I had a real strength when I was a hitter in this situation, Gary, because all I could see was a grand slam home run the next day. So that's what my swing was. So there's no chance of me hitting the ball on the ground. Swing well, as also, hard as he could. You also were fast enough to beat yeah. out the, uh, yeah. the potential right home play. Frequent pinch runner in your day. <laughs> Two and two to Pelfrey. Another good stop by Castro. Is at the block three or four in the dirt already today. You were uh, Rusty's caddy. Uh... Rusty's caddy, yeah, and he was not happy about it. I'll tell you that. Well, to this day he still gives me gruff about it. Wasn't like he was going to beat you in a foot race. <laughs> no, no. Not at that point. In his he career. should have loved it. It was a curtain call. He had what 22 pinch hits one mm. season. Kind of like Reyes. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Get, get the hit, jog off. <laughs> I saw Rusty this spring training, as we both did. He looked fantastic. Well, Levon got ahead of the opposing pitcher. 0 and 2 with the bases loaded. Now he's gone to a full count and forced Castro to stave off a couple of potential wild pitches along the way. So perhaps Pelfrey has Grand Slam on the brain now. I think he'd settle for RBI walk. <laughs> three two. And he's got a piece of it to hang in there. Still with the three two count on the pitcher. Hernandez comes with a breaking ball. Can't think of too many guys in baseball who would do that. Huh? <laughs> Dave Hudson's. In comes the shortstop and Gonzalez boots it and everybody's safe. And the Mets lead it three to one. Well, the rookie shortstop, Marwin Gonzalez, I'm sure, was thinking, got the pitcher running, I had a chance to get two, but he ends up getting none. Yeah, just the play that he got, he, he ensured by coming in that he was going to get the in-between hop with a lot of spin. And you have to be very short-handed to make that play, and he was not. Well, Pelfrey reaches on the air, but the good news for Mike is he gets credit for an RBI. Could have waited back and he still might have had time on that ball. So, 
Two runs home in the inning, still only one out. The bases remain loaded for Tejada, who is lined out to right and hit a very soft line drive to first base. 0 for 2. Ariston now at third, Foley at second, and Pelfrey at first. That's put up four runs on five hits against Levon the last time they faced him in three innings of work, and Castro again down into the dirt. He needed a night to test out that surgically repaired ACL and foot. He's, he's getting it here. Castro's going to be their number one. They traded away Umberto Quintero. They were confident enough that Castro was fully healed. They've got Chris Snyder as a veteran backup. And Tejada pulls it to third. A nice stop by Matt Downs. And the throw pulls Castro off the plate. And it's 4 to 1 New York. Uh, Downs made a terrific stop and had plenty of time to get the force on Hairston, but threw it wide. Boy, I thought, nice play here first. And gets up. I thought Castro kept his foot there long enough. Let's take a look as he does a great stretch. Boy, I thought he had his spikes on the very edge of that plate, but the call goes the Mets' way. I'm with you. I think yeah. he had his toe right on the front of the plate yeah. as he caught that ball. He made a fantastic athletic play. His toe's there, and then it comes off. You know, maybe he thought that uh, you know he was in front of that plate, but I don't know. Just looking at it from here, and not even on the replay, it looked like he kept it on. Tough angle for the home plate umpire standing behind that. So three runs are home in the inning, and another ball in the dirt, and Castro blocks that one. So it'll be a fielder's choice. I don't believe they charged an error on that play, did they? They should have because it yeah, would have been out had the they throw. made the connection. But they've yet to put an error up on the board. You got to assume that's E5 though. That's that rule you taught me you got to complete the play. So even though he made a fantastic play to dive, you got to come up with a good throw also. Yeah, it ends up being two separate plays. Yeah. One and one to Murphy, who has a base hit to right center and a ground out to third, one for two. I think this is one of the hardest things for a manager to do is to watch a veteran pitcher struggle in spring training. Because you know when the bell rings what you're going to kind of get with Hernandez. But whether he has enough to get people out anymore. Adalberto Flores throwing in the bullpen. Here's a quick light freeze cam on that play at the plate. It looked to me like he was out. Calling him as we see him. I thought that was a, a great athletic play by Castro. Well, CB's trying to do that too. <laughs> Just. Didn't see it the same one. Here's the 2 1, and that's blowing inside. And so now with the bases full, Murphy, his eyes can light up. David right on deck. Murphy, the eighth man up in the inning. Levon has already thrown 37 pitches in this inning. Four hits and a couple of errors. And now 3 and 1 on Murphy. And Daniel pops it up. Downs in foul territory has plenty of room. Yeah, that's the second out. Well, at this point in his career, Levon Hernandez gets you out because you become impatient. That's what it is. And for Murph there, it's 3-1 count. The bases are loaded. You just know you're going to get a fastball, and he gets a little slider there from Hernandez. That was I shouldn't have lit up quite so much. <laughs> So now David Wright, the ninth man up in the inning. David twice has fly to right, 0 for 2. And he bats here with the bases loaded and two out. Three runs home in the inning for New York. And that one knocked down by Castro. Fortunate that that didn't go to the backstop as he reached for that one. Just, uh, you know what happens for young catchers is that they get just a little lazy sometimes and just with the backhand and gets lucky. You know, the one stat I'm going to look at this year, Gary, all season long, if the Mets are going to be, as Mike Nicky has said, a surprise team, this is going to be a stat that's going to have to be huge. Two outs, getting that base hit. 
Keith always maintains when we talk about averages with runners in scoring position that it's all about average with two outs and runners in scoring position that really matter. It's a backbreaker for the opposing team and it just lifts your team. Tremendous lift. Well, the number last year for Wright that he is staring at is 771. That was his OPS last yeah. year on base plus slugging. His career mark 887. So it's more than 100 points below his norm. And you know, we all know the kind of player that David has been throughout his career, and that's exactly where he wants to get back to. And that slow curve fouled off to him, too. Well, you know, and, I, and of course, uh, you talked about the back injury already, but now you've gotten into a bad year, good year, bad year kind of scenario, and that never was David. He was as consistent a player as you could ever want. And I'm sure injury free, free he will be consistent again. 42 pitches in the inning now for Levon. And try to put right away. With the bases loaded and two out. 2-2. Two -two. Castro down in the dirt again. 3-2. and two. Ike Davis would be next. He got this whole thing started with a leadoff single. Now the Mets will have the merry-go-round in motion. Foley at third, Pelfrey at second, Tejada at first, all moving. Three and two and two out. And the slow curve drill to deep left. Back goes Martinez near the wall, and it's out of here. David White with a grand slam. His first home run of the spring, and it's eight to one New York. Well, David was watching that 3 2 curveball. And he threw it a couple of times in that inning. The 3 1 count to Murphy came back with a breaking ball, and David was waiting. Got that breaking ball up in the zone, and he's so strong. The ball was away from him, able to still hook it over that left field wall. Two out hits. Huge. That's a two out hit. That's a four run hit. It's a seven run inning for the Mets. It's also the end of the night for Levon Hernandez, who wound up throwing 44 pitches in that inning, 82 for his three and two thirds innings. And Adalberto Flores will come in. Ball to the bullpen is brought to you by Verizon. Mets up eight to one. We'll be right back. Alberto Flores, who pitched double A ball in the Texas organization last year, misses up and into Ike Davis, a ball and a strike. Well, it all came crashing down on Levon Hernandez in this fourth inning, and not helped out by his defense. Error by the shortstop, 
Marwin Gonzalez on the ball hit by Pelfrey. Error by the third baseman Kel uh, Matt Downs on his throw to the plate, although they still have not put up a second error. I don't know how they presume that that run scored if it's not an error. I mean, you normally try to feel this choice if you say the throw was late. Yeah. But yeah. the throw wasn't no. late. Like that was his only play at home, and it just was didn't wasn't there in time. Three and one now to Ike Davis. Ike had the base hit to left field that got this inning started. Just a little dunker. So the inning began innocently enough. Levi got a couple of curveballs up in that inning. One to Jason Bay, who tomahawked it for a hit, and then the one to uh, right for the grand slam. Well, that's got to feel good for David. Oh, yeah, big time. Only his third game of the spring. And all of a sudden, he's got that juicy four run home run on the board. Yeah, that's that grand slam smile right there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's ball four, and so the inning continues. What was that scene in Fever Pitch? Where he's having his buddies dance. He said, That doesn't look like, uh, that looks like Kansas City Royal dance. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the Mets with MLB.com at bat 12 for your iPhone, iPad, and Android. Get spring training scores, stats, highlights, live audio, and more. Text that bat to 31826 or visit Mets.com for details. Here's Jason Bay, who walked and scored in the second, and then earlier in this inning, hit that high breaking ball on the left for a base hit. But it's interesting to look at Bay's at bat and Wright's at bat in this inning. They both pretty much got the same pitch to hit. And David got elevation on the high curveball, but Bay almost took a high pitch and made it a low pitch. Yeah, he's he's just been a little quick. Um, you know, he's recognizing the pitch, so you know he's seeing it coming out of Hernandez's hand, but he hasn't been able to, you know, I think the parlance uh, these days is stay inside the baseball, but he's just been too quick. Well, he's got that way, and Keith could obviously do yeah. this way better than either of us, of turning the bat over. And as a consequence, he's hitting a lot of ground balls. And it's, it, it's, not, it's not a garden variety swing. Yeah. That's the best way to put it. Well, there was an interesting article in Sports Illustrated. If you uh, guys want to pick it up, with Albert Pujols talking about his hitting mechanics and how he thinks about hitting the baseball it was just so fascinating. But he believes that your top hand will come over, but it's got to come over after this contact with the ball. And what happens to Jason? It turns over before sometimes he hits the baseball. And back-to-back -back walks issued by Flores. So the Mets have two men on. And Mike Baxter will come to bat. Well, Kale is the new pitching coach for the Astros this year. Longtime big league reliever. Well, Kale was still pitching in the big leagues into his 40s. That's really. right. Got a good changeup. So now Baxter with two out of two on. He's the 12th man up in the inning. He provided the first out of this inning when he struck out on a curveball in the dirt. And he hits a ground ball to his right out to to make the play in the inning. Finally comes to an end. 12 Mets came to bat, and they score seven. Four of them on one swing by David Wright. His first home run of the spring is a grand slam on the Mets lead at eight to one.
Mike Pelfrey, after a long time in the dugout and running the bases, takes the mound for the fifth inning. That scored seven runs in the bottom of the fourth, so we'll see how Pelfrey fares going back to the mound. Facing Jason Castro, who had himself an active half inning. Run about 50 pitches, seemed like half of them were in the dirt. Chopped to third, and David Wright comes in to grab it. One out. Well, Kevin Burkhart is standing by with a guy who just rejoined the Mets this week. Kevin. Chris Young is here, guys. He's still very tall, I might point out, because he's a couple steps below me. And uh, Chris, first, it's just great to see you back. I mean, you had the shoulder capsule surgery. I know you stressed to reporters yesterday that every shoulder is different because everyone tries to compare you to Johan. But the bottom line is you, you're back on the mound and throwing a bullpen today, you know, less than a year after having the surgery. How's it all feeling? Well, so far, so good. Uh, I've been very fortunate. It's been a smooth recovery, but a lot of that is uh, I had a great surgeon, uh, great physical therapy um, leading up to this point. So uh, there's still a long way to go. It's still a lot of tests ahead, but uh, so far it's been really good. It's responded well, and uh, not that you know, not that it might be uh, there might be trouble down the road or there might be a setback here or there, but um, really, you know, thus far I'm, I've been very satisfied. You just told me that you've thrown 10 bullpens already. Has there been kind of a plan? Is it a little different than going out in front of Penn because of the recovery? Has there been like a certain plan or a certain thing that you're doing uh, kind of incremental each bullpen here? Well, yeah, it's uh, originally, you know, there was a structured protocol to follow um, as far as throwing, monitoring every throw, throwing a certain number of throws at, at different intensities and different distances. Uh, leading up to the mound work and then now that I'm at the mound uh, throwing bullpens it's more based on feel uh, but obviously um, you know if you if you throw a lot one day you got to back off the next and you can't overtax it you only have to throw so many sh uh, throws in the shoulder and you got to uh, you got to make sure you take care of it. I noticed, uh, you know, today it looked like, um, from my amateur eye, you were a little different on the mat. It looked like something was a little different. What is it, and was that uh, something that you looked at? And, and I don't know because the, the shoulder feels better. Tell me about that. Well, you know, over the last year and a half, pitching uh, with the, you know some discomfort in the shoulder. It's, uh, you know, you get in some mechanical things that are hard to correct, and you try to do it, uh, you try to just pitch pain-free. And uh, and so the last, um, really, six weeks, uh, throwing off the mound, I've been able to really look at my mechanics and try to correct a couple things. And uh, so, you know, my arm slot might be a little bit lower, um, but it's not really a change in the arm slot. It's my head positioning when it release is... Uh, is more upright. I'm not tilting my head, so it's coming down into its natural slot, and it feels good. So it's one of the things I'm going to have to stay on and uh, continue to work on, but uh, so far it's felt good, and the shoulder has responded well to it as well. What has been the thing that has sustained you and um, you know kept your energy, just the thought of getting back to this point? Has there been one prevailing thought that you've thought about through this rehab to try and get you back here as Murphy throws him out? We're going to go to break, and if Chris is so kind, we'll come back and finish up with Chris Young. It's Mike Palfrey looking good here in Port St. Louis.
In Park, Scott Harrison leads it off for the Mets as we continue with Chris Young, who's uh, here on a minor league deal, rehabbing from the shoulder capsule surgery, throwing his 10th bullpen already today. And when we went to break when uh, the last hour was closed, I was just asking, was there a prevailing thought that got you through the rule, that, that got you through all the rehab that you did, just kind of getting back to this game and getting on the mound again? Well, I, I wouldn't say there's one thought in particular, but just, uh, you know, the whole process, trying to stay positive and, um, you know, I got a lot of uh, inspirational phone calls from different people, uh, people like Oral Hershiser and Rick Sutcliffe, who have gone through uh, shoulder surgeries themselves and, and said some really encouraging words and stuff that, uh, you know, if they could get through it at similar type of uh, points in their career, um, why can't I? And so uh, just trying to maintain a positive attitude and, uh, you know, just the I love competition and, and the thought of being back healthy someday. Uh, that's that in itself has been enough. What is it, though, about this game, Chris? Is it is it just the competition? Is it the pitcher versus batter as Harrison grounds to third and he's throwing, throwing out one down? Is it you know, the pitcher versus batter that when you start this process a year ago, that's in your head like I got to get back to it? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's one of the elements that you love and just, uh, you know, being part of the team, um, being around a group of guys that uh, that you believe in, that you, uh, you know, you go you go through the ups and downs day in, day out, and the highs and the lows, and, and uh, being part of something special, and, and ultimately, you know, hopefully the chance to win a World Series is uh, is the ultimate, so uh, I'd love to be part of that someday, and, and hopefully it'll be here with this club, and, uh, you know, and hopefully this year. I know, you know, uh, yourself and Johan, recoveries, rehab, surgery, a little different, even though it's the same classification. You did talk to him a little bit. What, what kind of things did you guys exchange? He's been so encouraging. I mean, just, you know, he, he was uh, one of the first persons to uh, text message me and, and say, hey, uh, if I can get through this, you can too, and uh, we'll do it together. And, and he, you know, he's been so encouraging in regarding that. And then, uh, you know, and then inspiring too, seeing him back healthy and pitching well this spring uh, gives me hope and encouragement that I can do the same and, uh, and hopefully not far behind him. So, um, you know, he's been great, and uh, I'm sure that we'll have some, uh, some war stories to compare uh, through, this, through the rehab process, but uh, he's been a great leader, and, uh, and I'm happy to have him uh, to follow. You're working out with Mark Pryor, is that correct? Yeah, Mark is a uh, close friend. Uh, we both live in San Diego, and, and Mark has had a similar type of surgery as well, and uh, he's had a tough road, but he's feeling good and healthy right now, and, uh, and hopefully he'll get an opportunity sometime soon. Chris, just before we let you go, what's the plan going forward for you now? Uh, you know, is, uh, can you give an idea of what is next, you know, the next coming weeks for you? Well, it's going to be continue uh, my throwing progression, uh, continue the, the next step, and the next probably uh, week or two will be to face hitters, start throwing a live batting practice, similar to what pitchers do when they report to spring training, uh, the first few weeks of spring training, and, and start testing it and uh, increasing the volume, the intensity, and building up some arm strength. and and uh, ultimately leading to uh, some games. Also, John Roush is here. He's 6'11". Do you think that he could have gotten out on your sweet 15-foot jumper that you used to hit? <laughs> He's, uh, John's got me by an inch, and, uh, you know, he'd be tough. I might have to pull him out and then try to go around him, but uh, I don't know about posting him up, but if I took him outside, I think I'd get around him. <laughs> Chris, good to see you smiling and healthy. We'll see you again soon. Kevin, I th thank you. I appreciate it. Chris Young, guys, let's go back to you. Also one of the best passing centers That's I've right. ever seen. Well, you have to be able to pass in that offense oh, of the day, okay. right? You know, uh, the what, back door. you know what Henry Sims did for Georgetown this yes. year? That's what Chris yep. Young was in his playing days with Princeton. But, uh, you know, it's nice to see Chris back. And, frankly, if, if he's able to get back by midseason, which is his plan, that'll be faster than anybody has that's come right. back from that surgery. You know, that's uh, that's fantastic news for the Mets because uh, before he got hurt, of course, those four stops were fantastic. Mm -hmm. The three hit game, of course, in Philadelphia. And he has some alliances now here for, uh, from Princeton. Bob Guerin, the coach for uh, the Mets, his two sons, Bobby and Brett, go to Princeton and play baseball there. Meanwhile, Mike Pelfrey living large with an 8 to 1 lead. Batting here against Wilton Lopez. Lopez is going to be one of the prime time performers in the Astros bullpen. Lopez, a guy who was released by the Yankees, put on waivers by the Padres, picked up by Houston, and he has come out of nowhere to be a very big-time relief pitcher. He had an amazing year last year. Appeared in 73 games, low ERA, only 18 yeah. walks <laughs> I saw 71 that innings. Unbelievable. He had a little setback with his, uh, with his health this spring, missed a couple of weeks, but he's... Made a couple of appearances since coming back and it's been right on the beam. If the Astros have a strength this year, it might be their bullpen with Brett Myers as their closer. Pelfrey makes contact. Gonzalez throws him out and Lopez comes in and throws a 1 2 3 inning, which gets us through five here in Port St. Lucie with the Mets rolling 8 to 1.
a one-of-a-kind look at Mets spring training with the latest news from Port St. Lucie, insider info, exclusive interviews, and behind-the-scenes video. Mets blog presented by Verizon featured on SNY TV, your online home of all things New York sports. Mark Pelfrey, whose sinker has been working tonight, gets the first one over for a strike to J.B. Shuck. We talked about it in the beginning, keeping that ball down on the knees. There's another one just off the plate. That's the changeup from Pelfrey, which is a new old pitch for him. He threw it in college. He tried to tinker with the split finger for a while. Got had a lot of success with that two seasons ago, but the players have uh, made an adjustment and are laying off that pitch. So he's going to go back to that straight change. Miguel Batista is up in the Mets bullpen. We were talking earlier about those major league veterans on minor league contracts and for them five days before the start of the season is D-Day which means tomorrow the Mets have to make a decision on Batista and all indications are that Miguel is going to make the team. I was just thinking though in a strange way it's it's you know it's a, a guy like Devon Hernandez might suffer from pitching tonight and that decision having to be made by tomorrow and Chuck goes around, strike three. Third strikeout for Pelford. New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by Xerox, ready for real business. And by New Era. And by Partners Executive Transportation. Here's Jose Altuve with one out. And he takes ball one. Altuve has been up twice and grounded out both times. Ball and a strike to Altuve. Dolphins managed to keep his pitch count low. You see on our brand new score bug up in the left hand corner, 66 pitches. How do you like the new bug, Ryan? Well, uh, I'm getting used to it, but I think it's uh, something you have to have. Pitch counts are so important these days that we've got to let the fans uh, in on it. You're still going to keep your own pitch count, though, well, right? I, I think what you're saying is right because the pitch count has gotten to the point now where it affects just about every decision that's made yeah. in a game. Broken bat toward the middle. Tejada runs it down and the off balance toss just in time to get Altuve. Nicely done by Ruben Tejada. Another ground ball from Pelfrey, but a nice play. Perfect angle by Tejada and the ability to throw on that run accurately. You know, we talked about this a few seasons ago, and I think there was a part, maybe part of Keith and I, not you. That was boy, you know, the pitch count, pitch count, pitch count. But you know, it's such a huge part of the game that it really lets the viewer at home start to manage, I guess, right? right? Well, you know, whether you agree or not with yeah. the, you know, the hundred pitch plateau being the most important stat of the game, the fact of the matter is that's how managers manage. And you know, if you are a student of the game and you want to know what's likely to happen as the game goes along whether you like it or not the pitch count becomes of utmost importance and if, if a guy throws 50 pitches in the first two innings you know that it, the manager's getting himself ready to, to right. get him out of there after five at, at the best yeah it's going to be a full bullpen effort mm -hmm. I wonder in Washington if their bug will have not only the number of pitches for Strasburg but how many innings he's thrown mm -hmm. a running total since they're going to try to keep him under 160 is the number 160 maybe 160 is the number that they've mentioned now what happens if they get in postseason? I don't know. Two and two now to Ruggiano. But for the Mets and, and their prospect pitchers, and uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember who uh, wrote the article about it today, the most important numbers are not necessarily the, the total number of innings. It's the progression from year to year and not going too far beyond what they did the year before. Another one, two, three inning for Pelfrey. That's nine in a row he's set down. Nice outing for Mike. He's up eight, one in the sixth.
Home sixth inning. Ruben Tejada leads off against Wilton Lopez, who works a second inning in relief. And he throws a strike. It's become so shocking these days to see a pitcher pitch a second inning of relief. I had to do a double take <laughs> and make sure that that really was Wilton Lopez. Well, Francisco did it yesterday. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think you'll see it very often during the regular season from Frankie, but it's it's worth seeing how a guy responds sitting down and getting back up. I think that's what Terry wants to find out. Danny Herrera gets up alongside Miguel Batista in the Mets bullpen. Bouncer to short. And Marwin Gonzalez throws out his opposite number to Hata one away. I wonder whether Pelfrey is done after 73 pitches and six innings. Or if Batista is just getting it working. I personally would take him out. I agree with that. Because I, I, I you don't want any negative thing to happen uh, going the next inning. He just had an amazing outing, six strong innings. If he needs more work, he can go down in the bullpen like Jonathan Neese did in yesterday's ball game. And you just take everything out of this is positive for him. Nine straight retired by Pelfrey through the fourth, fifth, and sixth innings. And, uh, you know, he felt, and Dan Worthen felt, and Mike Nicky has felt, catching him, that he had made progress in that last start that he made on Saturday. But tonight, the proof was in the numbers. Yeah, I think, uh, and my count might be off, but I think I had 11 ground ball outs. Um, that's the number where he should be. He, everything was down in the strike zone. Um, he didn't really have to change speeds because he had that great sinker. Two and one to Murphy is one for three on the night. It's good to see Mike smile. <laughs> he needed one of these in the worst way. Well, if memory serves, two years ago when he got off to the great start, yeah, he had a spring training very much like this and did not pitch well until his last outing of the spring. Rounded toward the hole, and there's another base hit for Murphy. Well, he chased Altuve up the middle, and this time he chased him into the hole. And Murphy has his second hit of the night. Jonas Schwartz and Joe Benito will debate this weekend's final four matchups, plus bring you exclusive Mets player and coach interviews straight from Port St. Lucie on Daily News Live, presented by City tomorrow at 5, only on SNY. So the Mets have their eighth hit, and now David Wright, who has the biggest hit of the night. A grand slam off Levon Hernandez that ended Levon's night in the fourth. David is one for three on the night. And a fastball strike. Grand slam back in the fourth. 3 2 hanging breaking ball there from Levon. Line drive. Disappointment for Levon Hernandez. And uh, you mentioned Levon and his status with the uh, the Astros. He's one of those yeah. major league players on a minor league contract and not guaranteed a spot in the Houston rotation, competing with young Jordan Lyles and Kyle Weiland for the two of the the last two spots behind uh, Wandy Rodriguez and Bud Norris, Jay Happ. Two balls and a strike to right. And for a franchise like Houston that is trying to get younger all the time, that's a tough call. Yeah. I'm not sure that Brad Mills will factor in the fact that he didn't have a lot of great defense play behind him in that fourth inning, but still. Sometimes these late spring outings can have a big impact. Gonzalez with the shovel. Altuve, a nice turn over the sliding Murphy to complete the 6 4 3 double play. Little Jose Altuve getting airborne. After 6 8 1, New York.
Seventh inning changes for the Mets. Ronnie Cedeno went to play second base. Omar Quintanilla is at short, and Vinny Rotino takes over at third. J.D. Martinez leads off the seventh against Mike Buffer. There's Vinny. Mike Baxter moves from right field to center field, and Corey Vaughn over from the minor league side will play right field. Meanwhile, Pelfrey is still out there. He's retired nine in a row, and he throws a strike, and Kevin Burkhardt standing by with the Grand Slam kid. David Wright is here. I guess those abs are feeling just peachy. I mean, the, the Grand Slam kind of, does that prove that, David? No, no, I feel good, which is, uh, you know, important. This is the longest I've gone in the game so far, so, uh, you know, to be able to... Um, you know, play today and then go out there and make that day game tomorrow. I think will be a big test, but I'm, like I said, I'm feeling good and I don't expect to feel anything. You know, these injuries are, you know, we've seen so many of them over Major League Baseball the last couple of years. I mean, were you worried at all with um, just, the, just the uncertainty of it with the obliques and the abs and things like that? I mean, you can't go out there and, and be, you know, apprehensive out there because, you know, as soon as you do that, you know, you'll, you'll hurt something else. So you try to go out there, you play hard, and, um, you know, I, I take a lot of pride in going out there and playing hard. And, and you know what? If, if you get hurt playing that kind of way, you know, it happens. But I'm not going to change the way I play. This is Mike Pelfrey. He's being taken out of the game right now. Nice applause here. It's his best outing of the spring. What did you see from him? And what have you seen from him behind the scenes this spring? Uh, this is one of the best outings I've seen from him, uh, you know, in, in recent memory. I mean, just, um, you know, the, the important things with him is his confidence. You know, when he goes out there and, um, you know, he does what he does today. You know, he just pounds his own, throws strikes, and really uh, welcomes contact. When he gets in trouble, he tries to pick a little too much, and, um, you know, that's kind of when he starts getting himself in trouble with walks and, you know, leaving some stuff up in his zone. But if he goes and pounds the strike zone, he's got good enough stuff where, um, you know, he can dominate hitters. What was the offseason? What was that like for you, David? I know you've done some, a bunch of different things in the past. I know you've even incorporated things like tennis into your offseason regimen. What, what did you focus on this offseason trying to get better this year? Well, apparently not enough ab exercises, <laughs> but um, no, you know, I think it's just a lot of the same. You know, I'm an active person, so I like to stay active during the off season, and, um, you know, not just working out, but, you know, just doing, um, you know, like I said, I guess just being a big kid, you know, just, um, you know, being active, trying to, you know, obviously stay in good shape. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm relatively young, but, you know, getting up there, so I have to really, um, you know, maintain my diet and go out there and, you know, just do things that will help me try to play 160 weeks. Where, where is the balance between, you know, weightlifting, core stuff, whatever, you know, all the stuff that you're going to do in the gym as opposed to baseball stuff and maybe not even baseball stuff, whatever else you're doing? Well, everything I do in the gym has some effect on baseball. Um, you know, you go in there and, and you do different exercises and there might be, you know, weights involved, but it has something to do with a baseball motion or a baseball movement. So um, yeah, I think with the ad thing, it was just one of those freak things where, uh, you know, you turn the wrong way and, you know, something catches. And, and um, you know, I was lucky where it happened early enough in spring that, um, you know, I was able to kind of take it easy for a few weeks and, and get it back to pretty close to 100%. Some of the young guys on this team kind of get your juices going a little bit. I mean, I, again, it's not like you're 85 years old, but, you know, you're a veteran now. You've been around a long time as Danny Herrera is in the game, relieving Mike Pelfrey. You know, you get fired up seeing Duda doing what he's doing, seeing Nice doing, you know, things like that? Yeah, I mean, we got, uh, you know, the sky's the limit for a lot of these younger players, and um, you know, give me these guys any day to go out there and, and, you know, play a season with because they're they're hungry, you know, they, they want it, and um, those are the types of guys you want, on, types of guys you want on your team, guys that, um, you know, go out there, play hard, play the game the right way, you know, prepare, um, you know, have fun doing it, and we got a, a tremendous clubhouse and hopefully that kind of spills out onto the field what do you want to improve personally I, you know, I think just consistency um, you know the, the difference between um, you know kind of uh, you know that that great season and that you know okay season is just consistency I, I don't want to obviously you want to go through those hot streaks but when you get cold you want to be able to try to taper them off a little bit and you know and, and instead of lasting you know, week, two weeks, just last, uh, you know, a couple games. It looked like watching earlier in the spring before you had the injury, you lowered your hands a little bit in the cage. Is that accurate? Well, I mean, it's just you're always tinkering with different things, and I think sometimes that gets me into trouble, but, um, you know, right now I feel comfortable, and, um, you know, I think that's one of the things I'm also working on this spring is staying consistent with my approach and my kind of setup. You know, when I start tinkering with things too much, 
you know, it seems like you're going up there with a different swing every at bat. So, you know, you find something that you like, like I have now, and you kind of stick with it. Does that go back to what you talked about, the, the hot and cold stuff? I mean, is that is that part of that? Is that is that what makes you tinker when you get in those streaks where you stay cool for a little while? Yeah, I, I, no question. I mean, you, you want to go out there and get hits, and when you don't get hits, even though you might have good at bats, you know, you start wondering, what am I doing wrong? You know, i got to be doing something wrong because I'm not getting hits. And, you know, the game doesn't work like that. Um, you know, sometimes you can go up there and feel good, you know, swing the bat good, you just have nothing to show for it. So, um, you know, that's definitely got some, something to stay away from. You know, I think me and J-Bay both, you know, we spend so much time in the cage that you start messing with things you shouldn't be messing with, and all of a sudden, you know, you, you, have, you feel foreign in the batter's box, uh, you know, for four at-bats. Have you both tried to uh, temper that a little bit? Have you both tried to kind of get out of that a little bit this spring? Well, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it, you know, it, it obviously hurts you, but, you know, you know, it's the right mindset. The right mindset is, you know, when you're struggling to go work, you know, sometimes you can work a little too much. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think both of us have discussed that, and, you know, both of us feel pretty comfortable with what we have right now, and we have to almost remind each other and pinball each other and say, um, you know, we felt good. Let's let's go back to what we were doing when we felt good. I know it's hard. It's not in your DNA to, to stop working. It must be an interesting thing. It's just, here's your replacement, Rotino. Nice scoop by Ike. Ending over David. Thanks for the time. We'll see you soon. No problem. Thanks for having me. David Wright with a grand slam. Herrera gets the job relieving Pelfrey. Take a look at our Kia around the majors. Regular season underway, and Ioannis Suspenis hits his first career home run as the A's beat the Mariners over in Japan, and they finish that series one and one. Omar Vizquel still going, maybe not the oldest player in the majors. That would be Jamie Moyer, but the oldest position player will be on the Blue Jays roster. And Jeff Samarja, who has pitched mostly in relief in his career, will be in the Cubs rotation. They have moved. Uh, Randy Wells to the minor league. Wow. This is Fernando Abad, who should be the prime lefty out of the bullpen for the Astros this year. Ike Davis leads off. One for two and a walk. That's Telvin Nash now playing first base for the Astros. Justin Ruggiano moving from right field to left field, and Travis Buck. Now in the game in right field. Abad is the fourth Houston pitcher of the night. Levon Hernandez took it on the chin. Seven run fourth inning capped by a David Wright grand slam. I guess the only good news for Levon is that all but three of the runs were unearned. One and one to Davis. 
Well, John Roush is up in the Mets bullpen, and Mike Pelfrey, as uh, Ronnie said he might, is uh, continuing his work. You know, it's interesting with Pelf. He had such a uh, great sinker, but that he probably threw that about 85% of the time, so down there working on his breaking stuff. Well, he was tremendous, retired his last 10 hitters. Six and a third, one run, three hits, no walks, three strikeouts. Just 76 pitches in six and a third. Meanwhile, it was great to hear from David Wright. And by the way, David's chat with Kevin was brought to you by the Xerox business of baseball. Xerox ready for real business. Of course it was. Um, I thought it was fascinating to hear David, who, you know, I remember when he was 21 and came up as Ike goes down looking. To hear him refer to those young kids. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, you're right. Of course, he is now the longest tenured member of the Mets with Reyes having departed. And uh, not quite the elder statesman in that clubhouse, but he is the last guy standing right. from his uh, from his generation of, of Mets arrivals. Yeah. Out here in 2004. And uh, in many ways, the... The last piece of the Mets' last successful season in 2006. Driven to left field off the bat of Jason Bay, and that's the second out. Last year, SNY's Play Ball Award was a huge success, helping six local youth baseball leagues pay for much needed improvements. This season, it's your turn. Help your youth baseball or softball league with a $5,000 grant. Apply for the SNY Play Ball Award today at sny.tv slash play ball. And, and the reason I was thinking about that, I was reading today that you know uh, the Astros named Wandy Rodriguez, their opening day starter, and the, the story that I read mentioned that Wandy was the last player left from the Astros World Series run in 2005. Mm. And um, it got me to thinking about the Mets' last successful season in 2006 and who's left. No, that's right. I mean, that uh, that year that was so close, you know? I mean, it's almost like uh, yesterday you're watching that Wayne Wright curveball. I always remember the Chavez catch from that game. It just. Uh, Best catch I've ever seen in person. I remember that, but also I remember the uh, the Jeff Supon curveball to strike out Jose Valentin with the bases loaded right after the, uh, the catch. catch. And then Eddie made the last out in that right. uh, with two outs, ground ball to first base, I believe. You know, with uh, you were talking about Wandy Rodriguez and. Starting the opening day for the Houston Astros. They haven't had a left-hander start from them since Dave Roberts in 73 and 74 Not that Dave Roberts yeah. that Dave. Roberts. That's right <laughs> This one was not quite as fast <laughs> No famous stolen no. base Two and two to Mike Baxter, and he takes a call third strike, so quite an inning for Fernando Abad as he gets the Mets one, two, three with a couple of strikeouts. After seven, eight to one New York.
Earlier in spring training, Mets catcher Josh Tolley caught live BP wearing a GoPro camera attached to his equipment, providing us with an inside look from a major leaguer's point of view. To learn more about GoPro's products and how to capture your own sports memories, log on to GoPro.com. GoPro, the world's most versatile camera. Be a hero. GoPro. Matt Tui Asasopo comes in to play first base for the Mets. That is Raul Reyes playing left field. And on the pitch, one inch taller than Chris Young is John Roush. Well, the Mets aren't only going to catch you with Roush with his 6'11 and good fastball and slider, but they're going to change elevation on you. Daniel Herrera comes in, and then we bring in Roush. I don't think you can get much of a difference in elevation in the big leagues on any staff from the 5'6 Herrera to the 6'10 Roush. And the Her Herrera was great. His breaking ball was outstanding tonight. Well, brought in specifically to face the left-hand hitter, Brad Wallace. And, you know, we've seen Danny lean on his screwball a little too much sometimes. But his curveball is good enough against the lefties, and he threw it, what, two or three times during this. Yeah, season. I don't know if you'd agree with me, but I, I, I see a better curveball than he had when he came up to the Mets last season. A lot later break and sharper. Josh Tolley's still in the game. He's the only starting position player who's still out there toiling, which means he'll get tomorrow off. Jason Castro, one for two. He's had himself an active night. He had himself an active inning in uh, Avon Hernandez's 44 pitch fourth inning, where he had to go down in the dirt a good 15 times. Popped up. Should stay in play for Tolley. And Josh squeezes it one away. Well, the Mets have got an outstanding pitching today. Mike Pelfrey went six in the third, allowed one run, three hits. Herrera retired his two batters. Between the three of them, Pelfrey, Herrera, and Roush, they've now retired 13 Astros in a row. Here's Marwin Gonzalez, the shortstop, into a fielder's choice and took a call third strike. He's a rule five pick. He was actually in the Cubs organization taken in the rule five draft by the Red Sox who then immediately traded him to the Astros so the upshot is that the Astros have to keep him all year or offer him back and right now it looks as though he may make the team I mentioned earlier Jed Lowry who is slated to be the starting shortstop for the Astros is on the sidelines with a hand injury after hurting it diving back into second base yesterday Hurt his thumb, which is never a good thing to hurt, yeah. particularly when it's on your throwing hand. And especially, especially for Lowry, who has gone through many injured seasons already in his young career. I mean, he would have had that Red Sox job a few seasons ago if he could have stayed healthy. That's why the Red Sox had to go get Scudero a few seasons ago. Yeah. Strike three called, and Gonzalez down looking. So two out and nobody on. Geico Sports Night, your nightly source for all things New York sports. Tonight, much more from here in Port St. Lucie and everything New York sports. Geico Sports Night, all night, every night, starting at 10.30, only on SNY. This will be Travis Buck batting for the first time. Buck, the former Oakland Athletic. Well, he looked like he was going to be a star for when he first came up with the A's, didn't he? It was a first-round draft pick by Oakland. Yeah, it's interesting. That's what they were talking about at the cage today. That kind of uh, the top of the bat of Bay and also his body falling forward and not kind of staying back and underneath the ball. Jason got on base three times tonight, a single and two walks, and lined out to left the only time he was retired. So it was certainly a, a good night for Jason in terms of getting himself aboard, but it's it's the driving the ball that mm. that they're still waiting for him. and that will be the make or break for Jason's season. Ball two strikes to Buck. Best thing that could happen for these Mets hitters old and young as they pop out a couple of home runs during that first home stand you know. It's interesting because the Mets are going to be playing their final exhibition game Wednesday afternoon in Tampa against the Yankees and then flying back to New York. Good off speed pitch by Roush to get Buck. So the first they're going to see in the new configuration of City Field is when they get to the ballpark on opening day.
Last of the eighth, Corey Vaughn gets his first at bat. And he takes ball one for Fernando Abad. Landon Powell now doing the catching for the Astros. And that is Angel Sanchez playing shortstop. Josh Edgen getting ready in the Mets bullpen. He is still officially in camp. Although most folks believe that the Mets are unlikely to take edge in north seeing as uh, they don't want to start the clock on him he hasn't pitched above a ball and all that the fact of the matter is he's been terrific this spring Sanchez can't get to the ball behind the bag and Corey Vaughn has himself a base hit well seeing that grounder here as soon as he gets in <laughs> Ball just eludes his glove. Well, now Sanchez is, you know, he's a regular backup player yeah. for the Astros, and he normally wears number 36. We're told he left his jersey back in Kissimmee, which is why he's wearing a an 81 with no name. And I don't know if that had anything to do with him not fielding that grounder, but <laughs> that's funny. It's like Superman without his cape. Josh Tolley's played the whole game and had a good one. He's got two for three, a single, a double, two RBIs. Talking about Corey Vaughn getting that base hit. You and I were watching Corey on yeah. one of the backfields the other day, and you made the comment that his body type is starting to move a little bit further toward his dad. That's right. He's really filling out, getting a lot stronger. You know, he had that amazing season two seasons ago in Brooklyn, but right. came down uh, more to earth last year, I think, here in St. Lucie. He uh, actually played very well last year in Savannah, yes, Savannah, where he began the year, and then they moved him up to St. Lucie, and he struggled. Strike three called, and so Abad doing quite the job against the lefties. He's faced three of them, and he's got them all three looking. Well, he throws hard. He's got a good breaking ball. When he throw the ball in a corner like that, you're going to catch the left-handed hitter looking. This will be Scott Kazmar coming over from the minor league side. Kazmar, a former San Diego Padre, had 39 at bats in the big leagues back in 2008 with San Diego. That's picked him up as a free agent in the offseason, and he takes a strike. Asmar, a middle infielder. This looks funny when they have the, the double ear flap helmet. Well, plus it's the gazoo helmet. That's right. that's the uh, the one that uh, that David wore after he had the concussion. Close, close concussion. That's right. Interesting. They have all the, the vents to keep them somewhat cool during those hot summer days. Amazing all around sports, all the major professional sports, and their attention to concussions now. Every single one from football, who should have been first, <laughs> to hockey, of course. You know, uh, Brendan Shanahan, the, the great ex player now, is in charge of uh, meeting out punishments for hits to the head. Check swing grounder, in comes Downs, and he bobbles it and has no play. And everybody's safe. Probably an infield hit for Kazmar. <laughs> Well, swing and bunt here, and he did not look the baseball in. You saw that he one-handed it, did not look it in, and hit the heel of the glove. And once that happened, lost the play. Well, they're going to charge an error. Scratched the hit on hit for Kazmar. No home book here. Well, they didn't charge an error on downs that they should have earlier. Remember on the play at the plate where Castro stretched? So he's one for two. Omar Quintanilla for the first time, and he takes low and outside. I said on the air the other day, the, they're going to have to ace the final to bring their grade up a little bit. <laughs> well, when we get to New York, we'll have the best official scores in the world because they were all trained by the late Bill Shannon. That's right. He wrote the book. He did uh, literally wrote the book. Powell right at the screen and a nice play. Yeah, just enough room to pick that one off. And that's the second half. A great play here. You know, 
It's hard to describe how difficult this is for you people at home, but when it's coming down, it looks like it's going to be in the stands and it just curves back to you. Then you think it's going to hit the netting, and when it does it, they found the glove of Powell. By the way, Landon Powell is enormous. <laughs> he might be as big a catcher as I've ever seen. <laughs> He's a Bruce Bochy like. Who's the guy who used to be with the Pirates? Ryan Dolmitz. That's right. When he would try to catch. <laughs> Ronnie Sedanio up for the first time. Sedanio gets one foul. And the guy doing guard duty couldn't flag it down. Ends up in the hands of Bobby Parnell. I mean, they station the guy down there to make sure that everybody in the bullpen is safe. And I can't tell from here who it is. But he couldn't get a glove <laughs> on it. There he is. There in Langill. Bullpen catcher. Fly ball, shallow left. In comes Ruggiano, and it drops for a hit. Vaughn around third. He'll score. The throw goes to third, but nobody's covering there, and the ball stays in play. Casbar winds up at third, and Sedanio goes to second, and it's 9-1 to one New York. Well, well it, it's going to be hard to watch this all summer. I mean, that... No excuse for that play. Good hitting by Ronnie. Got a pitch in on him. See, Ruggiano's trying to make the play at third base, but Downs had come off the bag and wasn't even there to accept the throw. Ball almost went into the dugout, but it just barely clicked the edge of the fence there. And so Kazmar couldn't score. But it'll be a single and then an error on the left fielder, enabling Sedeno to go to second. Sedeno gets an RBI. And so Vinny Rotino will bat for the first time with runners at second and third. Three errors now officially for the Astros. Two in this inning. Well, the Astros lost 106 games last year. And if you look at the makeup of their team and the deals that they're likely to make as the season goes along, they may be hard pressed to lose any fewer this year. And then next year, they get to move to the American League and play in the American League West, West. with the Rangers and the Angels and, and those guys. Get to face pull holes in the game. That's hard to even say, isn't it? And it doesn't come off the tongue easy. You get to face you, Darvish. You, Darvish. With the 18 pitches. Shallow right. And Buck is there to grab it. Side retired. Mets had a run with the help of some poor Astros defense. And we go to the ninth. Josh Edgen will take them out.
in Port St. Lucie. Danny Muno over from the minor league side will play second base in the ninth inning. Ronnie Cedeno moves from second to third. And Vinny Rotino moves from third base to center field, which will make it uh, three center fielders for the Mets. That's right. right. That's right. And Josh Edgen will pitch the ninth inning. The Josh most, has been spectacular this spring. He really has had the most saves in the minor leagues for the Mets uh, last season with 27. And I will tell you, just watching him pitch, and you know, I'm not an expert when someone's ready to go, but he has as good a stuff on the left side coming into the bullpen as I've seen. Met pitchers have retired 15 in a row. Brandon Barnes will bat for the Astros as we go to the ninth. Barnes up for the first time. You see what he did in the minors last year 15 home run. And the fastball pulled to third. And Sedano is smooth. I'll tell you what, it's fun watching Ryan yeah. Sedano play defense. No matter where they put it, he can play anywhere. You know, you and I always kiddingly say when we see some like team like the Braves when they have Venters and O'Flaherty, we go, when the Mets going to get a Venters? Where's he going to come from? Well, maybe Edgen could be that guy someday. Our next SNY telecast, our final SNY telecast of the spring, will be Tuesday afternoon. Last game here in Port St. Lucie for this season as the Mets and Yankees square off. First of two meetings between the New York teams. They'll play in Tampa the next day. Final spring training game. Jose Altuve up for the fourth time. He's grounded out three times in a row. Last time up. Tejada made a very nice play going behind the bag to get him. Watch out on 95 North because I'm going to be driving home right after that game. So get out of the oh, way. You are driving back. Yeah, just get out of the way. Well, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm driving back with my son and he. He'll drive to no, half no, the way. Well, let's see. The game should end about five o'clock. Yeah. So you'll be on the road by five ten. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then he guns down Altuve two out. So the game Thursday is at one o'clock. Yes. When do you figure to pull into New York? Well, it takes me fifteen hours to drive from here to 15 New York. Fifteen hours? Yeah. Well, that sounds a little fast. Well, I probably shouldn't say that on there. <laughs> I mean, there there is some highway patrolmen in South Carolina <laughs> who might be alert to what oh, you just said. I go slow in South Carolina. <laughs> I do. I do. But um, I think I'm going to have to stop because uh, 15 would put me right in rush hour, trying to come in through New York City. So I think so you're uh, going to stay in overnight. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now, are you going to have any um, any any animals with you? Because I heard all about Keith and his cat. No animals. Uh, no, just uh, <laughs> myself and my son. That's as close as we get. Virgiano swings and misses, and it's one and one. But it was pretty interesting this year. Uh, we brought down because the places that a lot of the that we stay at, the TVs tend to be on a smaller size, and if you're used to a big TV, you run into trouble. So I brought my big TV, so on Saturday we can watch the. The final four. That is a great save on your part, yeah. by the way, yeah. because you're right. Uh, we would have had to go to the Duffy's yeah. Yeah. to watch, you know, with the rest of the world, which would be great because they have wonderful wings at Duffy's. They do, but it's uh, it's six hours there. It's, it's a long time. So better in your living room with your uh, your flat screen. Thank you very much for thinking of. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ooh, now that the plate it comes up, it hits Ruggiano. And, you know, fortunately, we're, we're off Saturday. I mean, we go down Jupiter, watch the Mets play. That's right. And then make it back in time for the Final Four. And then so, we're back on the air Sunday. Six o'clock, quarter to nine are the two games. It's going to be a... Who, who, how's your bracket doing? I don't do brackets. Oh, I did one for the first time in many, many years because uh, my son Jordan was down. So I, we had a bet. I thought all along that Kentucky was going to win. Yeah. Um, but I'd love to see Louisville beat them. That would be great. Great for the Big East. Great for Patino. That's who, right. Who I like a lot. And... Uh, it would just be really sweet for a team that I never thought would go nearly this far. But you know that's Patino every year his team is better at the end of the year than it was at the beginning of the year. You know there's no mistake why these veteran coaches end up in this year after year because part of getting to that final is is dealing with all the things outside of the uh, game outs off the court and these uh, veteran coaches do it better than anyone else of course. Edge and one strike away from ending it. And the fastball fouled off. Engine has thrown the ability, has shown the ability to throw both his pitches to both sides of the plate yeah. all spring. It's been very impressive for a kid with very 
limited experience in terms of the, the level he's pitched at. And he looks like he throws harder because he hides the ball very effectively. With those strong legs, those Broxton legs. You know, he's like a, a little bigger version of Billy Wagner sometimes when I see him throw. Maybe he doesn't throw as hard as Billy did in, in his heyday, but has a better breaking ball than Billy ever had. Pride of Francis Marion College in Florence, South Carolina. Three and two now to Ruggiano. And it's popped up foul. That'll come out of play. Whenever we'd go down for our spring trip in baseball when I was at Yale, we would stop at East Carolina, North Carolina, Wilmington, and Francis Marion was always one of the places we'd stop. UNC Wilmington. That's a beautiful place. Beautiful. Got the beach nearby. They're always bragging about they had this high school kid who was a pretty good basketball player yes. down there. What was that? <laughs> that Jordan guy? <laughs> they weren't bragging about him when he didn't make the, the varsity that's as a freshman. Right. Off the end of the bat out to left center, and that's going to fall for an extra base hit. Ruggiano with a monumental bat, and he's going to try for three. The relay throw to third is not in time, and Ruggiano has a two out triple. Well, if you want to make the ball club, that's a pretty impressive at bat right there. Yeah, it fouled off some real tough pitchers from Edgen. Finally got a fastball out over the plate. Patino is playing him a little shaded to right center, so certainly couldn't catch up with that triple by Ruggiano. So he's a third with two out, and now Telvin Nash will get his first plate appearance. Misses up and away for ball one. Nash is just 21 years old. Astros took him in the third round in the 09 draft. Has not played above the A ball level, but is starting to show the kind of power that they thought he'd have when he got drafted. And you see the big cut one and one. 14 home runs in the South Atlantic League last year. They say all the time the radar gun can only tell you so much. Yeah. When you look at Edge and that, he looks like he's throwing harder than the gun. Yeah, they, they don't get uh, very good swings. Uh, there's a lot of late swings, as you see here from Nash and also from Reggiano before he caught up with one. So again, Edge and one strike away from nailing it down. And the slider in for a call third strike, and the ball game is over. Nice finish by Josh Edgen on a night of tremendous pitching for the Mets, most particularly for Mike Pelfrey, who was outstanding. He was uh, fantastic. He's been talking about uh, working on finding that sinker ball, and he had it tonight. And that formula that he used tonight as a blueprint for his success all season long, if he can stick to it. Didn't walk a batter through just 73 pitches in his six and a third. David Wright with a grand slam and a seven-run fourth inning. And it adds up to a 9-1 to one Mets win over the Astros. Back to Port St. Lucie.